Hi, I'm Quillenink History, and this video will mark the beginning of a new series covering the history of ancient science, where we will cover the study of nature, starting with ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, all the way up to late antiquity and the early middle ages. This video will be devoted to formulating a definition of ancient science, and to explain how the series will be structured. The opinion that there was no science in the ancient world continues to be stated with considerable regularity and dogmatic fervor. And if this is true, this series will cover a non-existing subject. Anyone who has studied philosophy of science knows it's generally very hard to get a definite definition of what science is. And when talking about science in the ancient world, getting a clear-cut definition of what is supposed to constitute science is even harder. Many of the scientific disciplines we think of today, like physics and chemistry, did not exist in the ancient world. And moreover, until Aristotle, we don't have any theoretical framework tying all aspects of nature together, or any standardized methods for how the different aspects of nature are to be studied. Therefore it's important to remember that when we're speaking of the history of ancient science, we are not speaking of the history of one specific entity called science, but rather the history of a collection of different subjects that together are the ancestors of modern science. These subjects include mathematics, metaphysics, optics, theology, astronomy, philosophy, medicine and natural philosophy. Now a modern person seeing this might think, hey, wait a minute. Many of those subjects just mentioned are not scientific. What are they doing in a history of science series? This question is very important because it highlights a danger that must be avoided when studying the history of science. And that is to avoid studying the past scientific traditions only insofar as they resemble modern science. Because as a scholar David Lindbergh explains, we would not be responding to the past as it existed, but examining it through a modern grid. If we wish to do justice to the historical enterprise, we must take the past for what it was. And that means that we must resist the temptation to score the past for examples of precursors to modern science. We must respect the way earlier generations approached nature, acknowledging that although it may differ from the modern way, it is nonetheless of interest because it is part of our intellectual ancestry. Ancient science's relationship to modern science can be thought of as someone's relationship to his or her grandfather. The differences between the two persons might outweigh the similarities, but one is still the other one's descendant. Our definition of what is to be considered ancient science is therefore going to be broad, or at least as broad as that of the historical actors whose intellectual effort we are attempting to understand. One definite distinction will be made though, and that is the distinction between craft and theory, since when we're talking about ancient science, we're mainly talking about theories and methods by which they are formulated. Ancient technology does not fit into that description, and will therefore be left out of the series. To simplify the structure of the series, I will divide the time periods covered into four categories. The first one will cover the scientific achievements in ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. The second category will cover the pre-Socratic era that stretches between Thales in around 600 BC to Aristotle in around 350 BC. The third category will focus exclusively on Aristotle and his works in science. And I know what you're thinking. A whole category devoted to just one person? You can't be serious! I know it sounds odd, but when it comes to the history of ancient science, Aristotle is actually that important. In ancient philosophy, he's usually thought of as one important thinker among several, but when it comes to the history of science, Aristotle is undisputedly the most important philosopher in the ancient world, and I will explain why in a future video. The fourth category will cover the Roman and early medieval period, and stretches from between around the death of Aristotle in around 300 BC to around the 6th century. Outside covering different time periods and persons, I will also devote whole videos to the development of certain scientific disciplines in the Greco-Roman era. These disciplines are mathematics, medicine, astronomy and optics, 
and they will get their own videos because unlike other aspects of ancient science, they are in essence the same throughout the Greco-Roman period and are therefore best covered separately. Our main reference source for this series will be the second edition of David C. Lindbergh's The Beginnings of Western Science, which arguably is one of the best textbooks on ancient and medieval science available. If any other literature is used, it will as always be referenced in the description. That will be all for this video. I hope you are as excited as I am as we will start off the series in the next video covering the scientific achievements made by the ancient river valley civilizations. And don't forget that if you like this video and are looking forward to learn about the scientific achievements of the ancient world, hit the like, share and subscribe buttons.